in and getting getting resituated here. I am looking forward to uh, Ebenezer Samuel being here. The first time I ever had Indian food was in India, and uh, they had uh, gotten us to Bangalore, India, which is in uh, uh, towards towards the the southern area, not quite the tip, but towards towards the south. If you um, get a lot of customer service. A lot of times that's based in Bangalore. So we were in Bangalore and they take us to this one compound and it was my very first experience with Indian food, period. And of course, some of the local pastors with us that were going through the line, they say, please don't judge Indian food by this. <laughs> it, was, it was generous, but it was sad <laughs> at the same time. It was, it was not, they, they took us to some better Indian food later on that, that, that week. So, uh, but uh, I love Ebenezer, it'll be great to have him here. Um, it's been a long time since I've seen him. So hopefully you could be a part of that. He's a, a fascinating guy and just a, a great testimony of himself. Uh, today we are in Hebrews. We, of course, go through the Old Testament generally on, on Wednesday evenings and Second Chronicles, but we're in Hebrews 7 today. I am, just to uh, let you know, I was debating most of this week how much of this chapter we would take. I was uh, just really praying through two or three weeks in this chapter. Right now I'm looking at three weeks, but we'll see how it works out next week as well. But um, we're going to have to turn on our brains because we got some study to do today. Uh, but that's just the way uh, it's, it's written here. So we're, we're going to be ready for what God has to show us in this passage. Always have your Bible with you if you, if you uh, can. I know a lot of people have it on the phone or tablet. That's fine. But we do have paper copies for you if you actually want to look at it with a paper copy and not have that backlight shining at you. Um, if you didn't happen to bring one, we do have copies in the back. You're welcome to uh, take with you. Borrow if you want, but feel free to take, take it with you. But stand with me as we read the Bible together. Hebrews chapter 7, looking at verses 1 through 10 today. Hebrews 7, verse 1 says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, uh, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually." Now consider how great this man was, to whom even pa the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. And indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi, who received the priesthood, have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them receives tithes from Abraham, and blessed him who had the promises. Now beyond all con contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the greater, here mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them, of whom it is witness that he lives. Even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. And let's pray. Father, my tongue is already getting twisted this morning. I pray that you would loose it and let us hear your word and the things you would have to say to us today. And we do pray that it would be your spirit who teaches us through your word and that any real thoughts of uh, men might pass. What we need is the word of God this morning. And so uh, give it to us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You know, some arguments, if you're making them, they're, they're real simple. Others are vastly more complex. If I want to argue for the law of gravity, pretty simple. All I got to do is drop something. I could drop one thing, many things, varying ways to show you that they all fall down to the ground very quickly evident that gravity exists. But what if I were to argue for flight through the principles of aerodynamics? And some of you out there can probably explain that real easily for us. I cannot, right? It would take a lot of research on my part and it could certainly be done and we could point to birds and airplanes and all kinds of things, but the explanation is just necessarily more complex. You need to lay some groundwork on some basic principles before you can get to the more advanced ones, you know, if you're going to properly understood the idea. That same thing, that same principle applies to theology. Some ideas are obvious. Some ideas are evident. Others take a little bit more foundation to be understood. Take creation, for example. The world around us is prima facie evidence for the work of God as creator. Things exist because someone existed to them, if I can put it in those terms, created them, right? 
The evidence is there. Likewise, for Jesus' resurrection from the dead. All you need to do is have the disciples and at least 500 others see him alive, and it's obvious what had happened. It's amazing, it's miraculous, but it's still obvious. But when it comes to topics like the everlasting priesthood of Jesus, that's a little bit more complex. That's a subject that requires a little bit of groundwork, requires a foundation. And this is what the author of Hebrews does here at the beginning of chapter 7. Now, his ultimate goal is to demonstrate that Jesus is the perfect high priest. He's fully superior to the priest from the lineage of Levi. But the writer can't just merely assert that fact. He has to build his case. After all, he's writing to Hebrew Christians who are very familiar with the Hebrew law. They knew at least the basics about what God's word said about the priesthood, specifically how it was given to the uh, tribe of Levi and the Aaron, uh, lineage of Aaron and, and all the rest that go through that. And if the writer is going to prove that Jesus is the perfect eternal high priest, then it needs to be shown that there exists a legitimate worthy priesthood outside of Levi. And that groundwork needs to be laid before more specific arguments are made about Jesus himself, which comes in the rest of the chapter. So all this groundwork takes place at the opening of chapter 7. This is the point, if you recall, as we've been studying through Hebrews so far, this is the point where the author returns to his original thought because he had broken off on a digression at the end of chapter 5. It was in chapter 5 when he first wrote of Jesus being a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, quoting Psalm 110 verse 4. But it was at that mention of Melchizedek that occurred to the writer, my readers aren't really going to understand all of this. They were too spiritually immature. They had neglected their own necessary discipleship. They neglected their own spiritual growth. And of course, that led into this whole warning about the dangers of apostasy. Also came in with a few words of comfort, uh, reminding his readers of the assurance that we have of God's promises of salvation. Because God's not only given us his word that he saved us, he's sworn it with an oath. So we have double reason to rest easy and the promise of God. That was the digression. The digression now is finished, so the writer returns to where he left off, the priesthood of the order of Melchizedek. And he initially feared his, writers, his readers were not going to understand this, but he wades into those waters anyway. These are truths that all Christians need to understand about Jesus, even it does require a little bit of academic work to work through the topic. So he begins by diving into this mysterious person of Melchizedek. Who is he? How does he fit into the story of Abraham? Why should his priesthood even matter? These questions are all answered in these opening verses that lay the groundwork for us to see Jesus as our perfect high priest. So let's talk about Melchizedek's background in verses 1 through 3, where it says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, then also king of Salem, with meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. You get a run-on sentence, but we do get a proper introduction to Melchizedek, and the reader takes his writer's the writer takes his readers all the way back to the man's original introduction in Genesis chapter 14. And in fact, Genesis 14 verse 18 is not only the introduction of this historical person named Melchizedek, it is also the introduction to the entire priesthood. It's surely by no accident that the first time that the term priest, Hebrew Cohen, appears, it is in reference to Melchizedek. So he not only demonstrates the superior priesthood, he demonstrates the original priesthood. Just like Adam is the original man, Eve is the original woman, so Melchizedek was the original priest. So if we want to see what God's idea of the perfect priest is, we look first to Melchizedek, which is chapter 7 is going to show us, is going to lead us directly to Jesus, because there's no better priest than the Lord Jesus himself. But as for the Genesis account, it, it really is fairly short, self-contained, Genesis 14, Verses 18 through 20 say, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. 
Now in the context here in Genesis 14, Abraham or Abram at the time had just come to Salem after rescuing his nephew Lot who had been taken prisoner of war from this massive battle that involved nine kings, four kings against five kings. Read about that in Genesis 14 verse 9. And once Abraham uh, uh, had learned that his nephew had been captured, he took 318 of his own servants, he fully armed them, and he goes northwards in hot pursuit. He's got a posse after him, right? And so not only does he rescue Lot, he recovers many of the other prisoners, he recovers much of the spoil that had been taken from the battle. Now, although the eventual destination of Lot to return him was going to be to the city of Sodom, which of course comes up later on in Genesis, Abram goes first to Salem, and Salem is the precursor to what would eventually be known as Jerusalem. And this is where he encountered Melchizedek, priest of God Most High. God Most High, by the way, is a translation of El Elyon. Some of you may be familiar with that term. El Elyon is God Most High. And there, Abram ate a meal that was curiously similar to communion, bread and wine. He receives a priestly blessing in the name of the Most High God, which is, you know, the one God, the the God beyond all other pretenders, all others who claim to be God, the one God, the most high God. And then at that point, Abram gives a tithe of all of his own spoil to the priest, seemingly absent of any commandment to give a tithe. He just does so out of the free will of his heart. All right, that's what we know. That's all we know, in fact, of this man. The only mentions of Melchizedek in the Old Testament are Genesis 14, and that quote we already mentioned from Psalm 110, verse 4, And then he's not mentioned again in the entire Bible until the book of Hebrews. And there he's mentioned nine times between chapters 5 and 7. He's a most mysterious man, especially in the context of Genesis where so much is made of beginnings and genealogies. So many people get tripped up on all the begats in Genesis because there's so many there, these genealogies. Hebrew culture as a whole emphasized genealogy to a great extent. You want proof to look at the first nine chapters of 1 Chronicles. It's all there. But Melchizedek, he apparently appears out of nowhere. No parentage is provided for him, no father, no no mother, no family line of any sort. There's no mention of his birth. There's no reference to his later death. He's neither shown as entering the priesthood through ordination, like Aaron was later ordained into the priesthood, nor does he ever leave the priesthood through death. It's as if his priesthood precedes all and continues always. So it's never supplanted, it's never replaced by the Levitical priesthood because it was never declared to be ended. It continues through the ages unabated. And if that weren't mysterious enough, more mystery is added through the translations of Melchizedek's name and Melchizedek's role. Now the translation is interesting in itself because it's given in this context of the book of Hebrews, right? He's writing to a Hebrew Christian audience and they probably mostly, if not all, understood Hebrew. So why does he have to do a translation? Did he have to translate it for them to understand the name? Well, maybe, maybe not. I think the translation is given for two possible reasons. Number one, the writer has a theological point to make with his name and role. He doesn't want his readers to miss out on that just because they take the translation for granted. Uh, Just like we might meet a, a woman named Summer and we might not immediately think of the weather season unless it's pointed out to us, right? So he points out this translation to them. But secondly, it's quite possible, if not extremely probable, that the writer is at least somewhat aware that he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he understands that other Christians elsewhere that are unfamiliar with Hebrew would one day read his words. So this translation, praise the Lord, it's there for us because it's essential for us. So what are the names? Well, we've got Melchizedek. That does indeed translate to king of righteousness. The Hebrew word for king is Melech, which, you know, righteousness is translated Sedek. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Yahweh Sedekinu, right? The Lord is righteous. The middle E, Melchizedek, E, uh, it, it indicates the first person possessive, which technically translates Melchizedek as my king is righteous. But of course, the writer's translation is We could say perfectly acceptable because we don't have any space to argue it. It is inspired by the Holy Spirit. He doesn't need help in that. So the king of righteousness, as to king of Salem, translating to king of peace, this again is a direct translation. Uh, We've got the the Hebrew word for king Melech, and you you would see it there if you were looking at Hebrew on the slide there. The Melech is there, followed by Salem. And Salem comes from the same family as Shalom. And many of you know that's peace, wholeness, completeness. So it's that same idea. Right? So you got these two descriptions together, king of righteousness, king of peace. You combine that, a most unique man is depicted. 
The king of righteousness, who himself is perfectly righteous, is also the king of peace, who reconciles men and women with Almighty God, making us complete, making us whole. The king of righteousness, who is also the king of peace, really does point to one man. It points to Jesus because he is our righteous Lord, our prince of peace. And that is the point of the original author who wrote that Melchizedek was made like the son of God. He points to Jesus in a way that few people through history can, which, of course, begs a really important and interesting question. Was Melchizedek the pre-incarnate Christ? Was this a theophany? where God himself appeared before Jesus came in the flesh in Bethlehem? Was this Jesus in another form with another name? Various scholars hold passionate positions on the question, and convincing arguments can be made either way. Melchizedek certainly acts parallel to Christ. In many ways, he prefigures the work of Christ. But it cannot be ignored that the writer of Hebrews never directly says that Melchizedek was Jesus, And if anyone would have stated it clearly, it would have been this author. Instead, he uses a word that speaks of similarity, speaks of resemblance. And he could have easily said that Melchizedek was the Son of God, but he stopped short and he says that Melchizedek resembled the Son of God. He treats these two men almost as two different people, Melchizedek acting as a type of Christ, pointing to Christ. And that said, let's also acknowledge the writer does not explicitly deny that Melchizedek might have been the pre-incarnate Christ. He just doesn't make a positive argument for it. Now, if you're asking for my own personal opinion and just take it as my own personal opinion, while I cannot argue definitively that Jesus was Melchizedek, I do believe it to be highly likely. Uh, You remember how Jesus responded to the Jews in Jerusalem when he had one of his many arguments with them about his authority and about his person. They accused him of claiming that he was greater than their father Abraham, who was dead. And in response, Jesus told them what Abraham originally thought of him. You recall this in John 8, verses 56 through 58. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old. You've seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Now, to that statement, the Jews picked up stones to throw at him to kill him because he was believed to be guilty of the crime of blasphemy. He claimed to be God. Now, let's be clear. Jesus was claiming to be God. He just happens to be right. If we claimed it, it would be wrong, but he claims it is right. But to the point, there are only two real reasonable possibilities recorded in the Bible for Abraham seeing the physical person of the pre-incarnate Christ. One, you've got the the event where God and two angels go to Abraham and Sarah, promising that Sarah would bear a son. We read about that in Genesis 18. And then secondly, we've got this account right here with Melchizedek in Genesis 14. Now, Genesis 18, we could call that as a glad rejoicing of Abraham, but arguably it fits the account of Genesis 14 better. Because there is this worship that's here. This is a time of pure celebration, whereas the later encounter has a little bit more complexity. Now, is this an essential tenet of the faith upon which Christians should divide, whether or not Jesus is Melchizedek? Of course not. That might be of interest, but that's not the main point for the, the writer of Hebrews. Melchizedek's priesthood is like that of Jesus, and that's enough. And that's, that's all to know, uh, required to be known that there is another priesthood other than the Levitical priesthood that's legitimate. And more than just legitimate, this priesthood of Melchizedek is higher, and that's the point he's going to be making through this. And the superiority of the priesthood, that's explained next in verses 4 through 10. But verse 4 says, Now consider how great this man was, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. So the first way to see the supremacy of Melchizedek's priesthood is through the tithe. Who paid tithes to whom? Is that right, grammar? Yes, who paid tithes to whom? Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils to Melchizedek. Now, that might seem a little crass to talk about superiority in terms of finances, but we need to remember that money is not the issue here. Hierarchy is. Priestly hierarchy, in fact, is. Wealth has nothing to do with it, right? Abraham's not trying to get wealthy here. He's already immensely wealthy. He's already immensely rich. It's proven because he could arm 318 of his servants, not even a bat an eye as he goes to war, right? He didn't need the money. Melchizedek didn't need the money. He's what? A king. He's the king of Salem. He didn't need the money. So the issue is the path through which worship flowed, and that is a physical demonstration here in the tithe here in Genesis 14. Abraham was a friend of God. He was the man chosen by God to be the progenitor of not only the chosen nation, but the 
uh, the future Messiah, this great man, Abraham. But even Abraham needed to give to God in worship. And how did he give? Through whom did he give? He gave through Melchizedek. Abraham, as great as a religious figure as he was, he still needed someone greater through whom he could give his tithes and his praise unto God. And so this great man, this large, this important man that was chosen by God to receive these tithes was Melchizedek, which is quite possibly another argument that this is the pre-incarnate Jesus because he's that great. Now, let's take a little break because on the subject of tithes, much is said about tithes in chapter 7. is a crucial part of the writer's logic that shows the superiority of the Melchizedekian priesthood over the Levitical priesthood. But in that argument, the writer assumes that his uh, readers automatically understand what a tithe is, so he doesn't take the time to define it or explain it. The original first century Hebrew Christians were very familiar with it. It gets much more confusing the way it's taught in 20th and 21st century Christianity. The word tithe just refers to a tenth. That's all it means. The Greek is dekatos, and even if you look up dekatos in modern Greek, it just translates to a tenth. And the Hebrew term in Numbers 18.21, when it talks about the tithe, also refers to a tenth part. And you say, well, a tenth part of what? Well, a tenth part of whatever income increase a person had. The Hebrew farmer had a harvest of 30 bushels of wheat. Then three of those bushels would be given to the Lord as a heave offering, which in turn would serve as provision for the, the Levites and their families. And in the theocratic system of Israel, uh, you study that, and scholars will argue that up to three different tithes were commanded. You had one for the Levites. You had a, a second that was used in worship. You had a third set aside for the poor. And whether there was one, two, or three, that's up for debate. But the bottom line is that this is something commanded by the Lord, and it was used to God's purposes within the nation of Israel. Now, it's that last point that's key. It was commanded for Israel. When Jesus spoke on the topic, it was in the context of chastising the religious elite for their own hypocrisy within the nation of Israel. They ensured that they were measuring out careful tithes of their cooking herbs, but as Jesus said, they neglected the weightier matters of the law. So Jesus said, you should have done one without neglecting the other, right? Matthew 23, 23. But ultimately, this was to Israel in the context of Israel's covenant law. So this raises the question, does the tithe apply to the New Testament church? As a command, no. I know that's surprising. As a command, no. As a principle, yes. Consider how other laws from the Mosaic Command and the Mosaic Covenant are applied in New Testament Christianity. They apply as principles rather than as commands because we are not under the law, right? Christians, we can eat pork. Some of you eat it a lot more than I do, but we can eat pork. We can wear mixed fibers. We understand the principle behind these things that God calls his people to be different from the culture, we're to be set apart for him and for his purposes, but we are not under the kosher dietary laws and all the rest. Another example, we celebrate the fulfillment of the feast in Jesus, and we understand that we as the church, we're not obligated to gather for Passover or for the Feast of Tabernacles or these other feasts. We apply the principles without being bound to the law. The same thing must apply to the tithe if we're to be consistent. Now, many churches do treat it as law, but we are not under law. We have freedom and the grace of Jesus. Now the principle is clear. The principle is there, right? We, we designate a portion of our income to the Lord. We acknowledge our Lord as our provider. But as to the amount, we have freedom. Tithe is a great rule of thumb, but it is not to be a burden. So what is it that you can give cheerful, cheerfully to the Lord in joy? Give it to him in worship? Well, that's what you're to give. Because as Paul wrote to the Corinthians, give as you purpose in your heart, for God loves a cheerful giver. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7. All right, got the big issue out of the side. As to our text, the author of Hebrews makes a point that as great as Abraham was, and he was very, very important, of course, probably one of the most religiously significant people in all history, he still paid tithes to someone greater. And in the process, the writer contrasts the priest of the lineage of Levi with the one priest of the order of Melchizedek so far, starting in verse 5. And indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi, who receive the priesthood, have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. So again, you know, these Hebrew Christians that are reading this, they're very familiar with this concept of giving tithes through the Levitical priest so they would go to the temple and offer these things. They had done this all their lives as a part of their regular obedience unto God. 
And God did command the Israelites to give tithes to the Levites. Now, because the Levites had no land inheritance within the nation, because their inheritance was the service of the Lord, they don't have vast fields of their own to grow their own crops. They can't spend day after day tending to their own flocks and their own herds, right? They had to do the temp, uh, temple work, be at the temple doing the work of the Lord there, preparing the various sacrifices. So God provides for them through the tithes of the people. So that's where we read the command in Numbers 18, verse 21. Behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tithes in Israel as an inheritance in return for the work which they performed, the work of the tabernacle of meeting. This is a perpetual command for the people goes throughout all of Israel's history. The nation had not always been consistent in this. They get chastised for this later on through some of the prophets. But they were supposed to, by the time of the writing of the book of Hebrews, they were supposed to have brought their tithes to the Levites for nearly 1,500 years by this point. Now, from a genealogical standpoint, what is that? That's one brother giving to another brother. Abraham's sons, technically great-grandsons, who grew into their own tribes, they each gave 10% of their increase to one particular son. Reuben and Gad and Dan, they all gave it to Levi. So it might be argued that the tithe is intramural. It's a family thing done with the overall nation of Israel. But now we've got Melchizedek. With Melchizedek, things are drastically different because Melchizedek, he does not arise from the loins of Abraham. There's no indication at all that they're any way related outside of the future incarnation of Jesus being a son of Abraham. But this tithe, this unrelated uh, priest, rather, received a tithe from Abraham. So the father that's greater than all of his sons and great-grandsons gave his own tithe to a different priest, gives it to a better priest. So the tithe is one argument here, that he's a greater man. The second one is the blessing, because not only did Abraham give his tithe to Melchizedek, Melchizedek turns around and gives his blessing to Abraham. He blessed him who had the promises, is what it said here, Right? The promise of God to produce the nation, receive the land, bring forth the, the Messiah. He was holding forth to those promises. Now he was blessed. How great must a man be to be able to bless a man that's been given those kind of promises from God? Because Abraham had amazing blessings promised to him by the Lord God, things of which he was already receiving just the barest foretaste. So what could anyone offer him in terms of a blessing? But Melchizedek did. Look again at the Genesis account. Genesis 14, 18 through 20. Melchizedek came in Samuel, brought out bread and wine, priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And of course, then he gave him a tithe of all. So in the name of God Most High, in the name of El Elyon, Melchizedek declared Abram's blessing. The king priest knew that Abram was already blessed by God Most High, having believed upon God's promises. The king priest could rightly declare the person and the worth of God before Abraham, and Abraham's only possible response to this is to worship through the offering of his gifts. Because once we're aware of the awesomeness of God, the glory of his majesty, the glory of his person, all we can do is just worship, right? And however form that might take place. All right, so remember the premise here. Melchizedek is demonstrably greater than Abraham. Demonstrated through the tithe, it's demonstrated through the blessing. So thus far, the writer of Hebrews just has stated what has happened. Now he's going to explain his logic that underlies that, verses 7 and 8. Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. Here, mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them, of whom it is witness that he lives. So the blessing, the lesser, is blessed by the, the better. And the writer of Hebrews states that this is beyond all contradiction. In other words, it's an obvious fact that remains true for all people at all times. When Isaac blessed the disguised Jacob, Isaac was the greater of the two, not only being his father, but he was also the current heir of the covenant. When Jacob slash Israel later blessed Pharaoh, when he finally got down to Egypt in Genesis 47, it's not only done out of respect for, you know, Jacob's age being able to pass along this blessing, but it's also a demonstration that Jacob had more spiritual authority than the most powerful man in the world did at the time, right? Through the ages, fathers and grandfathers bless their descendants, the blessing always going from the better to the lesser. The one possible, the one very, very, very important exception is when we speak of us blessing God, because occasionally we'll read of David, we'll read of others in Israel blessing the Lord, First Chronicles 29, verse 10, David blessed the Lord. Second Chronicles 31, verse 8, Hezekiah blessed the Lord. Even the, the Psalms speak of God's people blessing him. Psalms 103 and 104 repeat the phrase, bless the Lord, no less than seven times. And we even sing it sometimes, right? Bless the Lord, O my soul. 
or bless the Lord, you his angels, bless the Lord, all you hosts, bless the Lord, all you works, all these things. If it is beyond contradiction that the better is going to be blessing the lesser, how does this work? Does it apply that we as a people are somehow better than God? Certainly not. Not by any measure is that the case. It is blasphemous to state otherwise. In the vast majority of instances in the Bible where the idea of blessing and the Lord are combined, the scripture is really just declaring the blessedness of God. God is already blessed. He's inherently blessed. He's the one from whom all blessings flow. We can acknowledge his blessedness in our praise, even declare his blessedness from our lips, but we cannot somehow increase the blessedness of God who's already infinitely blessed. We can add our voices to the angels, but we cannot make God more blessed because he's already inherently blessed. Now let's acknowledge it is right, it is biblical for us to declare God's blessedness, even saying or singing with the Psalms, bless the Lord, O my soul. All that is within me, bless his holy name. Psalm 103, verse 1. Just as we do that, we need to keep the right hierarchy in mind. Our blessing of God is the praise we give him, the praise that he's due. No, we do not give to the Lord the same blessing that he gives to us. All right, he blesses us as only God can bless. He grants us grace. He grants us favor we never deserved. He is the greater. He is the better. We're just his servants. We're his children. Okay, the blessing. Of the tithes, Melchizedek is demonstrably greater, not only in the fact that he received them from Abraham, something that's going to be emphasized in the next verses, but also that the person who receives them is qualitatively different when we're comparing Levi and Melchizedek. Levitical priests, they're mortal men. They live, they die. They're born, they die. Melchizedek is something else. Now, again, this gets to the debate whether or not Melchizedek was, you know, a, a type of Christ or a foreshadowing of Christ or if he actually was the, the pre-incarnate Christ. Because if the historical Melchizedek is truly immortal, then he can be none other than Jesus. Now, the writer of Hebrews barely stops short of going quite that far. And he's writing that it's testified, it's witnessed of Melchizedek that he lives. Uh, he's saying here that the Bible records only his life, not his death. But in that sense, his ministry, if not his life, can be thought of as being everlasting. So it reiterates this idea that Melchizedek's priesthood is never supplanted. It's never replaced. It pre-existed the Levitical priesthood. And while the Melchizedekian priesthood is not seen again throughout the Levitical priesthood, it remains at the ready for the very perfect priest to take up the mantle. And who is that priest? As the Psalms have declared, it's none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember that proclamation of God that we've quoted several times now that refers to the Davidic Messiah, the Lord, what the Lord says of him. The Lord says in Psalm 110, verse 4, the Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The immortal Jesus, truly immortal, right to the king immortal, 1 Timothy 1, 17. The one who died and rose again, the immortal Jesus is our forever priest in the order of Melchizedek. So what's introduced in Genesis 14, that priesthood, is seen again in Matthew 1, seen in Mark 1, seen in Luke 1, seen in John 1, as a proper son of God takes up that royal priesthood again, just as ancient Melchizedek once did. Close it out. One more thought about the tithes paid through Abraham to Melchizedek, verse 9 and 10. Even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Not only the patriarch of Israel who paid tithes to Melchizedek, recognizing him as the true priest of El Elyon, God Most High. It's also the priestly tribe itself. It's also Levi who did so. By extension, Aaron and Eleazar and Phinehas, all the way to Zadok and all the rest, right? They all paid tithes through Abraham. Now, granted, symbolic payment, because, you know, as the author of Hebrew submits it, you know, it, so to speak, as he says, it still demonstrates the principle. The Levitical priest paid tithes to Melchizedek as priests. They paid homage to the greater priesthood, acknowledging the validity of that other priesthood before they were even born. I know there's a lot of groundwork here. It's going to take a bit of time to develop, but the author is building his argument here that there exists a better priesthood than the one that his Hebrew Christian brethren have always known. It's a priesthood that's superior to that of the Levites, one that even paid homage to uh, by the Levites, was paid respect to by the Levites. The author has a lot more to say on this matter, particularly of a, a need other than that of uh, Levi's priesthood, as well as a, the need for a better covenant of which this other priest would mediate that's taken up through the rest of chapter 7 and into chapter 8. But for now, right here, the groundwork is just laid. 
There is indeed a priesthood other than Levi. There is a pre-existing priesthood, a superior priesthood. It's seen in the person of Melchizedek, who not only perhaps points to the Lord Jesus Christ, but quite possibly is the Lord Jesus Christ. But that possibility of the pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus aside, let's ask the question before we close, why should any of this matter to us? We're mostly Gentiles. See, if we try to look at this from the perspective of the original readers, the argument does make sense. And remember that God wrote his word not just for us in the 21st century, mostly Gentile church. He wrote for all of his people throughout all time, right? So it's not just written to us. But it does make sense to the original readers. The Levitical priest is not just merely part of the Hebrews' worship of God. No, it's essential to it. Because apart from a called, qualified, and functioning priesthood, the Israelites had no way to worship God. This was the reason why the genealogy of the Levites, particularly of the line of Aaron, is so carefully traced through the Old Testament. No less than three of the post-exilic historical books of the Old Testament, so you're talking about Chronicles, First Chronicles, you're talking about Ezra, you're talking about Hezekiah, or Nehemiah, rather, they take care to document both the original priestly lineage in the Chronicles and the qualified priests who return from the exile. You see that in Ezra and Nehemiah. And all three of the post-exilic prophets, you've got Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, they all deal with the priesthood in some way. Because without this priesthood, you have nothing. Without this priesthood, it, it doesn't matter what temple gets built or even if a temple gets built, because what good is an altar if you don't have somebody qualified to offer something on it? If the people of Israel were to worship God according to the Mosaic law, the word of God, then a qualified priesthood, that is a must. And the only thing the people knew throughout their entire history was the Levitical priesthood. And that is true for all of the nation of Israel, except for one single man, which was the progenitor of all Israel, Father Abraham. And Abraham himself knew a different priest knew a qualified priest, knew a called priest, knew a priest to whom honor was due and whose ministry never failed. And this was Melchizedek. And in his ministry, we see something greater than the priesthood that's found in the law because his priesthood predates the law. Now, Gentile church, this is precisely why this matters to us. For the Hebrews, they need to see the importance of this priesthood because they needed to see why this priesthood was needed when they already had one. But for us mostly Gentile Christians, we need this priesthood because we have need of a priest. Because in Levi, guess what? We as mostly Gentile Christians, we have no priest because we have no part in Levi. As mostly Gentile Christians, we are grafted into the olive branch of Israel, being blessed to partake of the promises of God. But we are not Israel. And we're graced to be included in the new covenant but while we can learn from the old covenant, we are not part of the old covenant. So while we require a priestly work to atone for our sins, we have no access to the priestly work of Levi. So where is our priest ever going to be found? We need a priest outside of Levi. Oh, now that makes the work of Melchizedek so much more important, doesn't it? This is the foundation by which the priestly work of Jesus is made available to us. This is how we can find atonement for our sins. We now have a high priest, and God made a provision for us to have a high priest. And how long ago did he make this provision? Well, nearly 4,000 years ago during the days of Abraham. And guess what? It goes back even further. Because how long ago did God plan your salvation? Since before the foundations of the earth. Never let it be said that God does not care for you. God has known of you since before time began. and He's loved you all that time. And he knew that you, because of your sin, you're going to require the work of a priest. And you're going to require the work of a priest that's outside of that national covenant of Israel. And he made provision for you by sending that priest before the nation of Israel ever existed. Then on top of all that, the Son of God personally comes for you. He takes that priestly mantle upon himself to provide for your sin in ways that you would never otherwise know. So does God care for you? Does he have plans for you? Well, yes, he does. Far more than you or I ever realize. I so pray that you would know the love of God for you, that you would know the priestly work of God on your behalf. And for those of you who do, who know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we can rest in his all-sufficient work, the priestly work of Jesus. It is fully sufficient, fully acceptable in the eyes of God, not just because it comes through the Son of God, because it's done according to the perfect, eternal plan of God. There is nothing about your and my salvation that is haphazard, that's made up on the fly. God's always planned for it. 
and his plans perfectly come to pass, which means we can rest in him, we can rest in his sufficient work. I hope you know that worked for you. And maybe you don't yet know it. You haven't yet experienced it. You haven't yet asked Jesus to be your high priest. You don't even know of his sacrifice on the cross. You haven't tasted of the Lord to see that he is good. Look to him today. Whatever else we can say about Melchizedek, we know this about Jesus. He is the king of righteousness. Jesus is the king of peace. He's the only way you could be made at peace with God. He's the one who clothes us in the righteousness of God. Our sins make us at war against God. Jesus makes us at peace with him. So I implore you, believe upon him today and be saved. You can do that as we pray. Father, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you for his perfect work. Being our high priest, called, acceptable, amazing. Thank you for his sufficient work. I do pray for any among us today who have not yet called upon him as Lord. Maybe they've known of Jesus, they've heard of him, and even believe basic historical facts about him, but they haven't trusted him in his priestly work. They haven't trusted him to provide that sacrifice for them themselves. Help them call out to Jesus today. Say, I believe you are the Son of God, and I do believe you went to the cross for my sins, that you rose from the grave. I believe you offered to save me, so please save me now according to your word. Make me a new creation. Lord, you give them the words they need to cry out to Jesus in this moment that they would trust you with all their heart and make them that new creation, burden them a new spirit this very moment, giving them assurance that they are yours. And Father, for all of us, we are so grateful for our high priest Jesus. And we are so grateful for your love and your plan for us, your plan which is astounding. Help us never stop being amazed. Thank you, Lord. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. When peace like a river attended my way when sorrows like sea billows roll what
the trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend even so it is well with my soul it is well with my soul it is well it is well with my soul it is well with my soul It is well, it is well with my soul. Well, amen. Will you all be wonderfully, wonderfully blessed this week?